Hey everyone, this is Luke Johnson and welcome to another installment of Literature Conversations with Dr. Jonathan Cook. Today we'll be discussing Melville's The Scout Toward Aldi. It is a Civil War poem, but I'll let Dr. Cook talk much more about that. Um, one of the first questions I want to ask as we discuss this poem is um, just kind of a simple one. How, when, and why did Melville become a poet? Okay, so Everyone knows Melville wrote Moby Dick and Billy Budd and maybe a few short stories. Um, but of course, Melville stopped uh, being a fiction writer for most of his life uh, in 1857 after he published the novel called The Confidence Man uh, because he was not making money as a writer. His reputation was going down and um, he really, he just couldn't make a living anymore uh, as a writer, um, no matter how hard he tried. And this was, you know, very depressing for him. So when he came back from a trip to uh, Europe and, and the Near East in 1856, 1857, he decided that he wasn't going to write fiction for the moment. Um, he instead turned to a short career for three years as a lecturer uh, because you could you know, some people were making a decent living on the lecture circuit, like Emerson, and um, he had he prepared you know three lectures, which uh, have been reconstructed. We don't we didn't um, end up with a copy of his lectures, but uh, one scholar has put them together, and they're and they're quite interesting. One is about travel, another is about statuary in Rome. Um, but anyway, he wasn't writing fiction, but by the late 1850s. He had started to write poetry, uh, part of it based on his travel, uh, or his travels in 1856, 1857, when he uh, took about six or seven months off um, and really uh, got a chance to spend some time um, seeing some famous artwork in Italy and France. And he also, of course, went to the Holy Land. He took a trip around Jerusalem. He saw uh, Greek ruins, he saw the pyramids, so he had a lot of uh, kind of touristic experience to write about. Um, so he tried to publish a volume of poetry in 1860 <clears throat> um, when he, um, he he left on a trip to go with his brother around the world on a clipper ship and he left a volume of poems with his wife to try to place with a publisher. Uh, the first place to look, of course, would be the Harper Brothers, where his a lot of his novels were published, but they didn't accept the volume. In fact, no one accepted that, uh, the book. And Hoth, uh, I'm sorry, Melville was um, very disappointed uh, when he got to San Francisco on this round-the-world trip. He, he heard, um, he found out that his book had not been published, and he, he kind of got discouraged and decided to go back home. So instead of continuing with his brother, he took a, a trip <clears throat> down um, uh, the coast and crossed, um, you know, where the Panama Canal is more or less, and came back uh, to New York uh, and then back home to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where he was living. Um, and uh, so he had these poems in, in manuscript which weren't published. And, some of them apparently uh, were, were published in a later collection in the 1880s. We're not really sure exactly which ones were in that first collection. But his first published collection of poetry was uh, his Civil War poetry called Battle Pieces, which you know was published by Harper Brothers. came out in 1866. And he claims to have written most of them uh, just at the end of the war, the fall of Richmond. Uh, but it's clear that he was he was writing some of them earlier, uh, a year or two earlier. So I think he started writing Civil War poetry and then got the idea for a whole collection. Um, and um, uh, was able to publish it in 1866 because there, there was a lot of poetry coming out during and after the war. Um, a lot of it very patriotic, inspiring. Um, uh, you know, poems like uh, Julia Ward Howe's um, Battle Hymn of the Republic that began as a poem before it got turned into a song. Uh, 
but Melville's poetry, of course, was more philosophical, and um, <clears throat> needless to say, it, to say it was not um, very popular uh, when it was published. So he, uh, you know, instead of being a fiction writer, he turned to poetry. But then, of course, later in his career, he went back to fiction with Billy Budd, and he also not many people know that he wrote a whole novel in verse, this epic uh, poem called Clarell, mm. uh, which came out in 1876, which is about a bunch of Americans and other nationalities taking a, um, a trip around the Holy Land, roughly based on the, the uh, itinerary that he, he took when he himself visited um, Jerusalem and the Dead Sea and, and Bethlehem and it was January uh, 1857. That sounds like something I'd like to cover in the future. I, I, we were talking off camera earlier um, that that you are a recognized Melville scholar, and I believe you had a book come out today, right? Um, yeah, actually, uh, it's interesting. You're we're talking about Clarell. That um, I just published an essay on the poem in this book, which is. Uh, of which I'm the editor with a friend of mine in Texas, and uh, it's called Visionary of the Word, uh, Melville and Religion. It's a, a collection of essays by various scholars, and my uh, essay on Clarell is uh, Clarell and the Victorian Crisis of Faith, which relates the poem to um, the... Um, what was happening in England in the 1860s and 70s, you know, following the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species, was the the um, rise of agnosticism and skepticism towards Christian doctrine. You know, the fact that we knew a lot more about the origins of the earth than the writers of the Bible did. So you couldn't take the Book of Genesis as an historical document. You know, we we knew at that point that. Um, the universe began in a very different way than you find in the first chapter of Genesis. So a lot of Christians in England particularly were losing their faith. People like Matthew Arnold, um, Arthur Hugh Clough. Um, so that was Melville in a later um, uh, guise as a poet writing about this phenomenon. Um, as an American, but reflecting a lot of the the sense of um, disillusionment and spiritual um, uh, sense of um, you know loss that came in the 1860s and 70s um, that was more advanced in England than and than in the U.S. at the time. Well, I think I know something that I want to cover with you in the near future. I'll, but I'll talk to you about that yeah. off camera. Okay. Uh, but but. Back to our subject, you know, talking about this poem of Melville's The Scout Tour Aldi, I gravitated towards it because it is, it supposedly takes place in, generally where I live yeah. um, in, in Northern Virginia. I wonder, and, you know, I, I did a recitation of it with um, my friend Jordan, and when I went out and visited you, I listened to it, and I nearly went off the road listening to it because the, the poem was so vivid, and it kind of um, made all the surroundings... Uh, time travel and yeah. and I felt transported um, to uh, a time that was um, I, I, I filled with all the Civil War imagery. But I wonder if you could say more about the environs of this particular poem that we're talking about today. Yeah, so uh, the sketch word all the it was it was published in Battle Pieces. Um, it was the longest poem in the collection. You know, it's about a 30 page narrative poem. Uh, taking the form of a ballad, and it's about um, the uh, hunt for John Mosby, uh, which was going on in 1863, 1864, 1865, um, because he was uh, a major figure in Northern Virginia, um, and his task as the leader of the 43rd uh, Virginia Partisan Rangers was to disrupt supply lines and the communications for the Union Army, which was um, trying to move into Virginia to eventually capture Richmond. Um, so um, the poem is about going on a scout uh, 
in Loudoun County for John Mosby and his Rangers, um, an expedition of cavalry. Um, and um, it, it shows an image of Loudoun County as it was at the time. You know, it was, it was a kind of a breadbasket of Northern Virginia. Um, today, we know Loudoun County is one of the fastest growing counties in the country, one of the richest counties in the country. Um, because of its proximity to Washington, D.C., uh, and a lot of open land, you know, land that was farmland, you know, 30, 40 years ago, is now uh, subdivisions. <laughs> so the landscape of the poem, uh, it begins in Vienna in a cavalry encampment in Vienna, Virginia, which, of course, is, uh, you know, a thriving suburb of Washington, D.C., and um, involves these cavalry uh, units going west, towards Aldi and Leesburg, um, which is, I guess, about a 20-mile um, distance. Uh, today, the main way to go uh, to, uh, say, Aldi from um, uh, uh, Vienna was, would be Route 50 or Route 7. Route 7 goes to Leesburg. Route 50 goes to Aldi and Middleburg. Um, apparently, the route of these... Mm -hmm. um, uh, the people scouting for John Mosby was somewhere between these two roads. And, uh, you know, what you're seeing in this poem is a lot of the landscape of Northern Virginia after um, three years of, of warfare, you know, demolished buildings, uh, trees that are shot up and stumps of ground. I mean, there were no, there were, this is not a battlefield per se, but it's, uh, a place where, you know, destruction has taken place for several years. And um, uh, the poem is, is about the unsuccessful attempt to go after Mosby and his rangers. Um, and it's just, it's a representative episode in this ongoing battle to, to try to find John Mosby, who becomes a kind of symbol of this... Um, unpredictable, uh, deadly enemy who was made into kind of a mythical figure because he was never actually um, uh, successfully eliminated. You know, he was shot, uh, I think, two or three times and recovered. Uh, he was almost captured several times, but he managed to escape. Uh, any kind of capture, even though the Union was directing, you know, hundreds of troops to try to eliminate him because his raids were so destructive. Um, and part of the way that he was able to elude capture for so long is that, you, like you mentioned, he was a guerrilla fighter and he was able to adopt tactics that I guess would have been unseemly at the time. And he was so familiar with the landscape out here, he was able to escape and use the the landscape as an advantage for him, and he sh he oftentimes I, gu I guess he was viewed as a bit of a terrorist by the yeah. by the union because he would exactly. often strike at night and he would he would target um, officers or whatnot. Um, he would do things that I suppose uh, gentlemen of, of warfare were not um, doing under the agreed upon rules of engagement, and I think that you brought that out really nicely in your article, uh, I believe you published it in the, is it the Transcendental American Quarterly? A a a it? ATQ, yeah. The ATQ. I have that. This is the journal. 2003, yeah. June 2003, the Scott Towards Aldi. Uh, yeah. A very uh, sort of basic information oriented reading of the poem and some of its historical uh, and literary background. Um, well, it's a fantastic but, uh, article. I loved it. Good. Well, uh, just to mention, you know, the, the fighting technique of Mosby was, uh, I mean, he he never had that many men. I think uh, I read recently in total about 1,900 uh, soldiers served with him, but at any one time there were just a few hundred who were available, and they would assemble for their raids uh, just by word of mouth because they had no encampment, they had no headquarters, they would just rendezvous um, at certain points based on instructions from John Mosby. Uh, 
Um, so there was no way to track them down anywhere because they had no headquarters. <clears throat> and they would often um, attack at night. Um, there weren't that many. They were very uh, good horsemen. They knew the terrain. And so they were, yeah, they were essentially terrorists who were trying to uh, intimidate the North and capture a lot of their supplies um, and um, interrupt their communications. I think one of the interesting things that you mentioned in your article is how uh, Mosby, because of his diminished numbers in comparison to the Union troops that were after him or that he was skirting uh, in Northern Virginia, he had to use psychological tactics. And that was something I heard about as a little boy, a lot about how he would amplify his presence by building up folklore around his persona or this folklore was built up, this this mythologizing tendency that yeah. seemed to surround his his persona. Um, well, I don't know if we want to give any examples yeah. of, of how he, of, of some of those things that were going on, or maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later yeah. in our discussion. But Well, he just got the reputation of, as being invincible. Um, after uh, surviving all of these attempts to capture him, right? He, he started his commission in January 1863, so he had all of 1863, 1864, um, into 1865. In fact, he was, he was one of the last Confederate commanders to actually surrender in June 1865, finally, after, uh, you know, two months after um, uh, Appomattox. Uh, so, um, but his, his legend began uh, really with um, northern journalists who um, covered him and uh, reflected the anger and despair and fear of the Union troops who tried to capture him, uh, you know, and who spent all this time going out looking for him, not finding him, or being suddenly attacked from behind or ambushed. Um, and um, they thought that somehow he was disguising himself all the time um, to be able to elude capture so much. Well, Mosby, after the war, claimed that he never wore disguises. Um, and, um, you know, uh, it appears that he was just being a very effective fighter and that the northern imagination magnified him into this mythical um, figure of deadly um, uh, effectiveness. And so, you know, he, he became a kind of a cult figure um, for, for, the, for the north, he was, a de he was demonized, and for the south, of course, he was, he was glamorized as um, you know this this wonderful uh, fighting force who didn't really require very much because you know people had to bring their own horse they brought their own supplies there was it was a low-cost operation for the Confederacy so my next question then is um, in in uh, I'm sorry, there's some background noise going on here. Um, so in what ways is the scout toward Aldi based on Melville's visit to the theater of war in 1864? Yeah, so Melville was kind of unique amongst major writers in the Civil War because he actually saw the scenes of battle and he witnessed a, um, you know, an actual um, army expedition um, in April 1864 because he came down um, to visit um, his cousin Henry Gansevoort who was in uh, in the um, the same group uh, of cavalry um, who were fighting against Mosby. His, his cousin was in the, the uh, New York cavalry uh, and the main group there were the second Massachusetts uh, cavalry who were uh, under the, the leadership of uh, Charles Russell Lowell. So Melville came to Washington in um, early April. He 
he um, got a pass to go visit some of the scenes of battle because they were about to begin spring um, uh, campaigns because uh, a lot of the fighting, you know, closed, shut down during the winter. So Malville uh, got a pass to go out to visit his cousin in Vienna at this encampment. His cousin, turns out, wasn't there. He was seeing to a promotion in Washington. But while he was in the encampment, he befriended Charles Russell Lowell, Colonel Lowell, who was, in, who was the commanding officer. And he also got permission to go on a, an expedition with Lowell uh, uh, that began on April uh, uh, 18th. So he spent a, three days on horseback with Lowell and 250 uh, uh, cavalry uh, who were uh, on a mission to disrupt Mosby's attempt to get uh, grain supplies in Leesburg. There had been word that somehow he was requisitioning grain. So the expedition was going to be, um, actually some soldiers were going to go out to Aldi and Lowell's cavalry was going to, were going to go out to Leesburg and then they're going to rendezvous and maybe head west to Middleburg, which was kind of uh, Mosby's, you know, de facto headquarters. So Malville was a civilian on horseback. I mean, he wasn't dressed like a soldier, but he he, he could have been shot if they were attacked by Mosby uh, during this uh, expedition. And uh, in fact, on April 19th, they engaged some of Mosby's raiders outside Leesburg and captured uh, 11 men in a minor skirmish. Um, and Melville witnessed this and, uh, you know, saw these Confederate prisoners. And then the, the group went down to all the to rendezvous with, the, with the, um, uh, the regular soldiers on foot. And um, at that point, they discovered that Mosby himself was shadowing their movements. And so there was no point in going looking for him in uh, Middleburg because uh, he already knew they were out there. Um, the only thing that Lowell did after this uh, discovery was he went up, he sent some men back to Leesburg because he found out that a wedding uh, of one of Mosby's men was taking place in Leesburg and he wanted to um, disrupt it. So he went up there and there was some shooting in the streets. Um, <clears throat> no Confederate casualties. I think uh, some of his soldiers were wounded. So he went back to his base with these Confederate prisoners and some of his own wounded men um, without any, um, you know, luck in confronting Mosby. Now, the poem that Melville wrote, the scout towards all the involved, this glamorous colonel leading his men to attack Mosby and then being ambushed uh, unexpectedly while trying to go to Leesburg to disrupt a wedding. Um, and uh, the colonel being killed. Well, that didn't happen when Mos when Melville went on the scouting expedition with Lowell. Lowell actually was killed the following October at Cedar Creek in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, he was a heroic, um, very well-educated, um, uh, kind of a beautiful ideal uh, officer and... Uh, so that happened in, uh, after Melville knew him on the scout. Uh, my theory is that um, the, the, the colonel who was killed during the scout um, by ambush is based on a previous incident in a scout for Mosby that was led by a guy named Sewell Reed, um, whose wife was visiting the camp at the time, and he was killed in an ambush um, behind a, a stand of trees, uh, kind of like as described in the poem. So I think when Melville went on his scout, he heard about all the folklore and historical facts about Mosby, and one of the most recent uh, stories he probably was he probably heard was about this disaster involving the the death of. Sewell Reed as the commanding officer and the fact he had to go back, you know, had to bring his body back to his, his wife back in the camp because that is part of the poem 
uh, uh, in Melville. You know, the, the scout involves the expedition returning and ends with the terrible um, tragedy of bringing the body back of the of this glamorous colonel to his wife who um, is staying in the camp. Do you think that was an unintentional or an intentional misrepresentation of the historical record? Well, I think I think he was he was just creating fiction out of his experiences, and and uh, he just wanted to make the point that um, these expeditions were often deadly, and you know some of the killed could be the uh, the commanding officers, and right, and uh, I mean the fact is Lowell was killed later on, and his wife was in the camp. F. E. Lowell was there when Melville visited, so. Um, He's just combining his experience of Lowell and Lowell's later death and the tragedy for Lowell's wife that she had to, you know, bear for the rest of her life with the historical incident of this other officer uh, a couple of months earlier getting killed. So, you know, like any artist, he's taking his own experiences and, and blending it into a sort of idealized image of of what he's trying to represent. I think what I think uh, something that we covered when we spoke about this uh, before was that through all the pieces in or all the poems in the battle pieces and maybe in this poem we get from Melville um, kind of a God's eye or bird's eye view or a panoramic view of the Civil War uh, that we don't really get from anyone else. He's sort of unparalleled in that respect. And maybe we'll speak a little bit more about that. Um, he doesn't yeah. seem to really be, be with equal on, on that, on that issue kind of giving us yeah. that all encompassing view through, through his works of art. Yeah. Well, no one, um, as far as I know, published a collection that included, um, so much of the war. I mean, his, his volume of poetry is, you know, 120, 130 pages. Um, um, and the poems are generally short, um, usually not more than a page. And he's just, he's giving a, a historical outline of the, of the war. He begins, the first poem is about the hanging of John Brown. And Oh, wow. Um, you know, the, the march after the, surrender of the South, and uh, in fact, the very last poem is about, uh, you know, Lee, Robert E. Lee going into the Capitol, being called in um, after, year after the war, to testify about what was going on in the South. Um, so he's giving a whole historical frame for the, for the Civil War, and then zeroing in on certain key battles and events and personalities. Um, so when you read the book, you really, um, you, you get a, a, a very broad sense of, of the war as, a, as the huge, um, complicated uh, historical event that it was. That's, um, that's fascinating. I didn't know that. So what would you say are some of the, the main themes and characterizations in the poem? And like, what kind of image does the poem present of, of Mosby himself? Okay. Um, so, you know, one of Melville's big themes is the nature of evil and the, and the, the justification of evil. Uh, I mean, this, the general topic, um, uh, that this goes under the general heading is theodicy. You know, why is evil exist if there is a God out there who should prevent it? Um, so, uh, you know, in the poem, Mosby is, is sort of the embodiment of evil, but you don't know where he is. You don't know when he's going to strike. It's, it's the kind of opportunistic nature of evil that is, is so uh, unnerving. And, uh, and uh, so that's a major theme of the poem. Uh, and it's interesting that the name Mosby, <laughs> if you drop the letter S out of it, you end up with Moby, and you know Moby Dick, of course, is the great <clears throat> symbolic white whale, and the 
epitome of evil for Captain Ahab and um, kills him in the end, as we all know. Uh, so another major theme of the poem is is the uh, dispute or the well. well let, yeah. let me let me stop you there. Yeah, that's huge. That's absolutely huge. That I'm, <laughs> I got all this noise going on here, but. That's absolutely huge that Melville would write a poem about chasing yeah. a man, uh, chasing um, a yeah. whale named right. Moby. Yeah. And with this whole poem yeah. and this whole chasing, Mosby, a, yeah. chasing Mosby and never catching him. <laughs> it, it's almost, you know, too good to be true. <laughs> History repeats itself. Uh, he, it, he almost, you know, could have predicted this. So, yeah, I mean, it's the biggest poem. The longest poem of the collection. It is a, it is really a short story in the form of a poem, and um, it's about this mythical character, you know, instead of a mythical whale, uh, who is impossible to capture, uh, and it just shows that, um, you know, evil is never going to be gone from the world. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a ongoing task to find it and to fight it and to <clears throat> protect against it. <clears throat> so um, it's it's a little bit, you know, uncanny that he got a, a chance to retell the same story as his uh, most famous novel. Um, so anyway, I was also saying that, the, you know, there's a dispute between age <clears throat> and experience and youth and idealism. You know, the one <coughs> theme of the battle pieces is uh, the youthful enthusiasm for the war of some of these young soldiers, you know, going off and <coughs> trying to um, um, do good for their country and just, you know, getting cut down uh, by, um, you know, the terrible carnage that took place during this war. <coughs> so... Um, you know, one of the themes of recent history on Civil War is just how deadly it was, you know, how these new weapons, how these new bullets, you know, mine balls and rifling in, in the rifles, you know, made a much more accurate kind of gun and a, a more deadly kind of bullet. So the carnage of the, of the war was just, just mind boggling and, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, people were just shredded when they were when they were shot. <clears throat> so this um, is uh, gotten some you know more attention recently from uh, historians, and I think Melville's battle pieces reflects the you know his his theme is really the tragedy of war, the the horror and tragedy of of these young men going out and sacrificing themselves to for this ideal um, that they'll never you know see and the and the <clears throat> the heroic nature of of you know, some of these soldiers and what they're doing. So, how would you contrast the rendering of Mosby <clears throat> in the poem versus what Mosby was like in <clears throat> Eric Lowe's real life? Yeah, well, you know, Mosby was just a very smart, efficient officer who, you know, he went to University of Virginia. Um, and um, um, he, he actually didn't graduate because he got involved. Uh, he was uh, a little bit small for his size, and he, he was bullied as a young man, and actually some guy in Charlottesville uh, kind of challenged him, and um, Mosby confronted him, and the guy started coming after him, and Mosby pulled out a pistol and shot him. Uh, wounded him, um, and um, he uh, he was sent to jail. Um, uh, and then while he was in jail, he decided to study law. And um, the guy who convicted him uh, actually helped tutor him in the law. So when he came out in the 1850s, he uh, late 1850s, he he had a short career as a lawyer. And then um, uh, he wanted, he was actually um, 
join the Confederate Army, but uh, eventually saw that he could best serve the Confederacy by being a scout. And he, he scouted for Jeb Stewart um, <clears throat> for a while um, before he founded his own guerrilla group in January 1863. Um, and it's funny because I was just reading that uh, one of Mosby's successful raids was across the Potomac River uh, against a Union encampment, and um, it appears that uh, uh, when Lee invaded the North, you know, uh, and was turned back at Gettysburg, uh, Stuart was only arrived the second day of the battle because he was taking the same route that Mosby took across the Potomac River because he said it was a great place to cross, but it actually delayed him from reaching Lee, um, Lee's army, and uh, you know, so it may have helped turn the tide of war against Lee. The fact that uh, his um, this famous scout John Mosby had told Stuart to ford the river at this certain place that. <clears throat> delayed his arrival. Um, so anyway, Mosby, uh, you know, formed this band of Parson Rangers, and he he just was a very efficient fighter. He was smart. He you know he studied the classics at UVA. He knew Greek and Latin. He took uh, uh, you know various works of literature with him to uh, <clears throat> around with him during his um, his time as a soldier. And um, you know his very his efficiency as a soldier led to his creation as a legend, and the fact that he was using these guerrilla tactics. You know, so people just assume that he was uh, this multifarious character when he was just in his own mind he was just doing what he thought would be the most uh, efficient way to fight the North as a as a guerrilla fighter. What I thought was really interesting about our previous conversations about John Mosby, um, the first is something you enlightened me to was that he became a Republican in the post-war Reconstruction effort. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And I, so I wonder if you could speak to that. And then also the most fascinating factoid that you dropped on me was that he, years later in the silent movie era. He well, started. He started. Well, he, I, I, I was. I misspoke. He. Oh, they okay. made a movie of him. He was an old man by that. This is uh, 1916. He watched while someone made a silent movie about, about his career, and I think the the, the film has since disappeared. Um, okay. So, but just to um, go back to Mosby after the Civil War, he was. Uh, he actually complained that he was more hated in the South after the war than he was in the North while he was uh, a guerrilla fighter because he became a Republican, became friends with Grant. I mean, right after the war, he was a lawyer in Warrenton, Virginia. Uh, but then he joined the Republican Party and helped campaign for Grant in 1872. Um, and a lot of his uh, former colleagues, of course, were Democrats and they hated the Republicans. So he got a lot of flack uh, for doing that. He eventually moved to Washington, D.C. in uh, about 1876. Uh, tried to work for the government for a while, but then in 1878 he went out as a consul to actually Hong Kong. Um, and he spent um, uh, about seven years in Hong Kong as the consul there. And he was a very efficient civil servant. Uh, he cleaned up a lot of corruption uh, of um, that was going on there with the China trade uh, and the opium trade. And so the irony is that Mosby served the North as a very efficient uh, civil servant uh, in a way that you know kind of balances out his um, uh, all the you know, nefarious deeds he did fighting the North during the Civil War. You know, he became an, a backer of the Republican Party and uh, a very good civil servant. And then he finally, he left Hong Kong uh, 
in 1885, um, and uh, he actually ended up living in California after that for 15 years, working for the railroads out there, uh, hunt, uh, uh, Huntington, uh, and so he was kind of a railroad lawyer for a while, and then finally came back to this area uh, after that in the early 20th century, and um, at some various points in the late 19th century, he was writing articles about his career as a um, as a Civil War fighter and published a book of memoirs. And um, <clears throat> you know, because he was undefeated, he became a kind of a byword for uh, you know Confederate pride. And so now, you know, today you have the John Mosby Highway. <clears throat> Route 50 between Dulles Airport and Winchester, uh, and then you had all this uh, pop culture um, coming out in the 20th century based on his career. You know, a TV show in the 18, uh, 1950s called The Grey Ghost. Um, you, uh, you know, uh, Melville's poem was probably the best representation of him in his Civil War um, phase. Um, but then, um, you know, he was, he was glamorized and turned into this sort of pop culture figure. I think there's a computer game, um, of, uh, on Mosby as well. You can buy, I forget the name of it, <clears throat> but he, he lives on his, his, his legend lives on today. Well, definitely, especially where I live. I mean, there are many establishments, uh, named yeah. Mosby's. I, Remember one of my favorite places to eat out as a kid was Mosby's. Mosby's, uh, yeah, I know. There, uh, I when I was living in Middleburg, two thousand one, that was the place to get free pizza on uh, Monday nights. You know, or, <laughs> best <sure>, best Shirley <laughs> Temples in the land. Uh, it was a, that, it was it was a great bar, and then what? It closed in about two thousand four or five. Yeah, and then I think they relocated it to Percival, and now I think it's a it's a, a Mexican restaurant now. So I, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe someone else will resurrect it or something. I love the old building yeah. it was in. Um, we're probably coming up against another hard break here, yeah. so I'm going to conflate these last two questions because I think they kind of spill into one another. Yeah. So I think it'd be interesting for those who are listening to know how Melville's Civil War poetry was received and how it stands up today. How is he viewed as a Civil War poet by today's standards? Okay, so uh, there are some people, myself included, who think that he's America's greatest Civil War poet. I mean, the only real competition is from Walt Whitman, <clears throat> Drum Taps, which is a, a section of Leaves of Grass. And Malvo's poetry is, uh, it's a poetry of, uh, of, uh, you know, philosophical inquiry uh, about the war. So you're getting not just a record of events, but you're 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 getting you know hard questions about <clears throat> why why are these young men dying and uh, uh, you know what can we learn from this war? And uh, you know he's he's just investing a lot of interesting literary meaning in in the war in a way that no one else quite was able to do of course when his when his volume was published in 1866 no one was really able to recognize the poems for what they were they wanted you know patriotic hymns they didn't want to read sort of shakespearean meditations about the war so <clears throat> the volume was pretty much panned as being frigid too intellectual um not lyrical enough, not enough patriotism in it. And, you know, William Dean Howells wrote a famously harsh uh, review for the Atlantic Monthly. And, you know, the book sold uh, just, you know, 100 copies or so, I think, just a few hundred copies printed. <clears throat> so Melville, of course, was probably very disappointed by that because I think he wanted to make a comeback as a writer uh, for the country as a whole to sort of represent the war as a as a, an American tragedy, so to speak. 
and uh, so it didn't rescue his literary reputation. <clears throat> um, not too many people read it. He went back to work finally um, after you know ten years of not publishing anything except this Civil War poetry. Uh, he went back to work as a customs inspector in 1866, and you know he started making money again. <clears throat> and he moved back to New York City. Uh, he had actually moved back in the fall of 1863, in the middle of the war. Uh, before that, he was living in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Although he was came into the city often because his brother Alan was a was a lawyer there, and uh, he actually uh, uh, moved into the house that Alan had had owned on um, uh, you know the East Twenties in Manhattan, and uh, you know apparently wrote all the civil, all these poems in that house um, in his study and uh, of course he would never emerge from obscurity uh, for the rest of his life um, he left Billy Budd you know in manuscripts and uh, so his Civil War poetry was never really explored uh, except for the last in the last few decades you know people have rediscovered it kind of as one of the last elements of his career that scholars are investigating. You know, the 1920s, we had the Melville Revival and Moby Dick, and you know, gradually the other works were revived, but it's only in the last you know, two or three decades that you're getting a lot of books and articles about the Civil War poetry because it just took a long time for people to get around to reading it and thinking about it. Sometimes it takes time for the uh, people to really understand the shock of something truly wonderful and innovative introduced into the world. Yeah, um, I, I share your sentiment on Melville's poetry. I'm, you know, I'm a philosopher by training, but uh, I, I mean, I, I love it. I see it as so deep and so rich in comparison to a lot of the other poetry that I encounter that seems frivolous by comparison. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's just it's it's. Uh... Uh, it's challenging, you know, in a way that other poets aren't as much. I mean, he the, the language is uh, sometimes, uh, you know, not it's not mellifluous. There's a little bit of lyricism, but it's almost it's sort of Browning esque in its angularity, as opposed to, you know, a more of a Longfellow, uh, you know, easy listening kind of uh, <laughs> poetry. So it's challenging sometimes to read, but it has its kind of rugged beauty to it. <clears throat> Definitely. All right. Well, Dr. Cook, I have to bring this session to a close. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for all the information that you imparted today, and I'll be in touch again soon. And everybody, okay. go down. Everybody, go down the Noetic app and follow us on YouTube and SoundCloud and all the other places, so you can stay tuned for further installments. Thank you. Okay. We'll see Bye. you.